This episode of the Golf Guru Show is brought to you by EnviedHemp.com. As golfers, you know the game creates wear and tear on your body and mind. Enveed CBD products can organically rejuvenate you. They come in three varieties, relief, clarity, and relax. Relief CBD products help relieve pain. Clarity allows you to focus on those critical shots. And relaxed CBD products are for those anxious golf moments. Right now, I've got an incredible special for you. Go to EnviedHemp.com and use the promo code GURU20 for a 20% discount for life. It's not what you know. It's what you can prove. You know how to cut to the core of me, Baxter. You're so wise. You're like a miniature Buddha covered in hair. I want to become a guru so girls will like me then I will like myself. Now before we do this, let's go over the ground rules. Rule number one, no touching of the hair or face. Of course. And that's it. Now let's do this. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Golf Guru Show. I am Jason Sutton, and I'm the Guru, where it is my mission to interview the top instruction minds in the business, break them down, get them to share all of their stories, best practices, and awesome information that has made them great and successful, then ultimately share it with you guys so we can all get better at teaching and coaching this crazy game. I am very excited about my next guest, as it is PGA and LPGA tour coach, Jeff Leishman. Jeff is someone that I've been wanting to get on the show for some time as I've sort of followed his career and we have a lot of mutual friends um, that we will talk about here in in this episode. And I am very grateful that he could take time out of his busy schedule to join me. Uh, A little background on Jeff. He is a Golf Magazine Top 100 instructor, Golf Digest top teacher in the state of Florida as he works out of the Dyer Preserve Golf Club. Uh, Other than the many tour players that he works with, which is a long list, uh, includes uh, Daniel Berger and Will McKenzie and many, many more. Uh, I was so impressed with his ability to build and sustain his relationships with his players. I think he's worked with Daniel for since he was a junior golfer, uh, which is impressive. And then also to have the confidence and the care for his students uh, that definitely comes across in this interview uh, to bring in other coaches to help his players, such as John Graham, uh, John Sinclair, John Tattersall, and Tyler Farrell, just to name a few. Uh, he calls this his advisory team, uh, which I think is really cool. And it shows his thoroughness to gather information on his players and really not leave any stone unturned uh, to help his players perform at the highest level. I wanted to read a quote uh, on his, from his website Uh, that sort of encompasses uh, this advisory board. It says, I firmly believe that building a team of professionals with whom you're able to consult is essential to being the most effective coach you can be. Uh, This is especially true if there are a range of motion issues, physical limitations, or injuries to be considered. And it said, it's not about me and my ego. It's about giving a player the best opportunity for success. So I thought this was really cool, and it really embodies... Uh, the type of person Jeff is, as I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this wide-ranging conversation, uh, as Jeff is such a great guy, and feel like we connected right away as if we've sort of known each other for a long time, even though this was the first time we've actually talked and met. So without further delay, I hope you enjoy this awesome conversation uh, with top coach, Mr. Jeff Leishman. All right, Jeff, thank, uh, thank you for taking the time, man. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I... Um... I've been looking forward to this for the last couple of hours, trying to work out the uh, the bits and pieces of actually making this happen. Yeah, the technical difficulties never end, but that's uh, you know part of podcasting, and that's uh, that's what we do. So we just kind of power through it. And I've been excited to, to have you on the show uh, since we connected a few days ago, and I want to catch you before you go on your West Coast swing. So uh, let, let's start from the beginning. I've, I've got tons of questions. I've... Uh, sort of been watching your career from afar because we have a lot of mutual friends uh, that I know you you have consulted with and 
we'll get into that, but tell the listeners sort of how you, how you got into teaching and how you got to your position today. Well, I was a club professional in Ontario, Canada, uh, fairly early on. It was a companion or conjunction thing with going to college in Canada. And I was um, in the business program at a university in Canada, and I was working in the summer times at, in golf. And then I decided to uh, come to the United States, both in conjunction with where that's where things were happening and also with the idea that I was going to play a little bit more and uh, ended up in, of all places, Jupiter, Florida. Not which a was bad just, spot. Pure, <laughs> just purely a coincidence. Yeah. Is when that decision happened, it had more to do with this mini tour that was down here called the Golden Bear Tour. And I played some and I was fortunate enough to do a lot of my immigration work before 9-11 when things changed significantly for everybody coming into this country. And I got hooked up at that time uh, fairly early in that process with a 18 hole par three golf course in Jupiter called Jupiter Dunes, um, nicknamed Little Monster. And my wife and I ran that for a while and we I transitioned out of playing and started getting back into the teaching thing and we ran a junior golf program and then Jupiter became what it is now that most people know it as kind of the home of almost the home of professional golf in the United States. And I've got this great relationship now with the Dye Preserve and the teaching coaching thing has been the serious focus for probably about 15 years now. So are you, are you a full-time employee at the reserve? I mean, is that your sort of your home base? You, are you employed by them or are you just sort of work out of there when you need a spot? I have a great relationship where I actually have, um, I'm a member to coach out of there. So I've got a great relationship with the, uh, the principal owner and, uh, he was nice enough to build this fabulous sitting bay there and offered me about 10 years ago now the ability to be able to do that because when i was at jupiter dunes we didn't have a driving range so i had to get really creative with um, where i was going to do this and every year there was a relationship that occurred with a local golf course and then it seemed like every year i was negotiating something and then when this came along it was really what turned into the transition away from jupiter dunes and my wife and i were running the golf course together and then my trick wore off with having her help me do that because when I wasn't there very much anymore, it just turned out to be not really her thing. So that's, uh, we, we're no longer doing that with Jupiter dunes. And, um, I'm, when I'm not traveling, the dive preserve is my home. So how did you, how did you get into, so you were obviously a good player that you sort of came from that playing background. Talk a little bit about your junior career and sort of what led you, I mean, that's a big move, right? Going from Canada all the way to South Florida. I mean, yeah. was it just, you know, for that tour? But I mean, give us a little insight. Into, I'm, I'm curious about your mindset because I'm really fascinated by the way you teach and, you know, how your players look and whatnot. So I just want to kind of dig into like how that evolved. Like talk a little bit about the early days. Well, I played junior golf in Canada and, uh, a lot in Ontario. And I grew up in an era when um, there were people that were going to college in the United States, uh, mostly actually to places like Kent State, or there was sort of a pipeline with Canadian golfers. And I had a pretty good junior golf career, but not enough where it really meant that I was focused solely on golf. I actually played basketball in university some, and it was more of a business pipeline for me. Like I was, uh, I went to school for business. Um, I was always thinking that golf, my dad and I, we'd always talk about how golf would be this great companion thing with business. And then the more that I started to compare what I was doing in working in golf and, and playing more. And I played as a, as an assistant golf professional and played in things in, um canada and then i would always come south in the winter time because the canadian pga owned a golf course in titusville florida and that was kind of the home of the canadian pga so i'd come down and i played the tommy armor tour in the summertime or in the winter time excuse me in orlando and i'd play other things around when i could um but never really the intent that it was going to be my thing not not different than a young college player going to, with the idea that they were going to play pro golf and then i got some financial help to be able to pursue playing a little bit more seriously but i was pretty naive about it all like looking back on it it was not a good plan but the thing that i try to give <laughs> people now 
it was it was just more like this leap of faith like you like you're saying like we're okay i'm gonna come down here i'm gonna be in florida i'm gonna attempt to do this and see where this leads and it didn't really have a plan it um and i saw some really good teachers at the time i spent some time at the ledbetter academy i went to see craig shanklin i went to see i'm trying to think i went to see a bunch of different people um mark brewer uh, or Brad Brewer, Brad, me, Brewer, Brad, yeah. Brewer mm-hmm. Brad Brewer, and um, I I tried to piece together some kind of plan. Like if I'm looking back on it in retrospect, like I was trying to sort of get some sort of direction. And it, and this isn't really a fault of anybody that I went to see, but it really was at a time when, in my my perception of that whole procedure, was that it had a lot more to do with teaching. Like like okay, this is the you're, you're going to get taught this stuff or this style. And that helped to mold me in what I do now, where it's pretty common to talk about the difference between teaching or giving a golf lesson and coaching. Sure. And and that that is really, in my mind, only really come about probably in the last 15 years. That um, yeah. that coaching term is a lot more of what people use. And I would say that that's not been the terminology in only, just only been really in, in recent. Like if you say that you were a golf coach, it was usually associated with that you, what school were you at? Like yeah. which college program college were coach. you part of? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it's totally changed and it, for the better, in my opinion. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of that background. Yeah. I, yeah that's, I, that's perfect. I mean, like how would you describe, and we'll kind of get into, I want, I'm curious about like that transition from playing to teaching or teaching to coaching or whatever you want to describe it. Like first, Give me your definition or difference between teaching and coaching. And then obviously it's a blend, right, of what we do. Um, yeah. and, then, and then how that's sort of transformed from when you were playing. Because I think that's – and that was what you kind of stole one of my questions is like you know, we all have influences, whether it's from other coaches that we've had lessons from or observed or, you know, been mentored by. So how did that come about with you? And like talk about the difference between teaching and coaching. In your mind, well, teaching and coaching now, as it, it, it in some ways, it's semantics, or it, uh, the, these words can be synonyms. They, they, they are can mean the same thing. Sure. But for me, uh, coaching involves more of a, a long term relationship that you that you're going to be involved with somebody, and you're going there's going to be some of the more common used terminology or, or um, references like there's going to be observed practice. There's going to be supervised practice. There's going to be some planning of, around some structure that may involve change in someone's movement. But at the same time, there's a relationship to or a reference to, is this going to help them score better? So coaching to me is, is more of a broad view of how those pieces come together and not necessarily the lesson structure of let's find something wrong with this person to justify why they're paying us, which is sort of kind of the thing that we all might've been part of um, earlier on. Like, okay, we charge this amount for an hourly lesson. We better find something wrong in a fairly quick amount of time, 45 minutes to an hour and then send them on their way. Yeah. Um, some of us are, and, some people are still in that mode. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, and, and like, it, it's how fast can you diagnose that? And so, um, coaching to me is a little bit more of the follow up to that, like, um, which would lead to multiple visits. It's not meant to, it, this is not about the difference between whether someone teaches hourly or that that's not my intent in answering that question. It, it's just more that like that formula in some ways to me seems like golf triage. Like, okay, how fast can I diagnose the big flaws um, or like get something, package it up in a a way and and then send them. Um, And I'm more along the lines, like my relationships are annual with people now. So I, um, and and most of the relationships I have with people are long term. So Daniel Berger is going on maybe 12 years now and then people like Will McKenzie are longer than that. So um, that's kind of how it's shaped me. Yeah, and that and that's I mean I, I love how you put that. And how did you have any of that transition as far as when you started teaching? Or because you know I, I mentor a lot of young coaches, right? 
and everybody says they want to teach tour players, right? It seems glamorous, and everybody wants to, you know, teach the best players, and that's great. But there had to be some learning, some failures, some stuff going on in between, between, you know, when you first started. I know you, you caught Daniel at a very young age, but how much of that trial and error did you have to go through before you started teaching tour players? And I want to get into, like, you know, who, who was your first tour player, and then – your ability to keep a player, right? I mean, as you know, you're on the, you're on you're on the the PGA Tour tee every week or most weeks now, and you know guys are getting fired left and right, and guys are getting hired. I mean, that's a it's a yeah. different it's a different uh, environment out there. So talk tell us a little bit about how that transition happened to when you first started getting the better players. Oh well, first of all, uh, PGA Tour driving ranges are much busier places now than when I uh, and and. I'm in my early 50s, and this transformation has happened in in my my period of doing this. Um, it wasn't really that long ago when I first started this that um, people would look at the player and the coach like, "What's wrong with you? Like, why do you have that person here?" And that has been in a really short amount of time. That's mm-hmm. that's in that 15 year period where now it's almost like if you don't have somebody, what's wrong with you? Yeah, that's, that, that's that, amazing. That, it, 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 yeah, to think about that happening in 15 years in in the in the the sort of chronological time frame of golf that this is all a very small amount of time so um the influences for me some of it was certainly what i felt like i needed or would want when i played um, sure. but more so looking at other sports some of that was tennis uh, and it really wasn't related to daniel and his tennis background and i have a really good relationship with his father who is was a high level tennis coach mm-hmm. and still is and played that um, the team environment, and I'd heard about these things sort of on the kind of like rumors that Bernhard Langer had a team and that certainly the the mystique associated with Tiger Woods and what kind of team was he doing having around him and what were the things that he were doing to get a competitive, what he was doing to get a competitive edge. But that whole model has really only been in a pretty short amount of time that um, the the idea that you have that kind of people with you and that you're not broken or mentally damaged or that something is wrong with you, that you actually have a, a, a group of people around that are that are objectively looking at what you're doing and saying, okay, is this helping? Is this, uh, are we on a good track? Because when the player is in it, it's really subjective. They're volatile and they're going to be ups and downs based on performance. So uh, the, the timing of that really for me had more to do with uh, going from teaching a junior program and being part of the uh, the annual or the hourly lesson deal mm-hmm. and um, having a few more of these professional clients and then it involves travel like you start to go to the events and which is quite common now but it, uh, to be honest sure. with you it wasn't then you know the, where you would see coaches was at the majors or you would see them at the big events you, w- you wouldn't see them at the bc open you wouldn't see them at the less events. Uh, that just wasn't really the place that they would go. Or you wouldn't see them at tour school. Like I've been to a lot of tour schools and seen um, like second stage and first stage stage and be and be part of all that drama that happens. Yeah. And coaches certainly go to those more now and rightfully slow, but it wasn't really that common 15 years ago. Is, was Daniel your first tour player that you worked at? You had somebody before no. that, right? T- talk about yeah. the beginning, like. I think this is a good, this is a really interesting subject of sort of the ins and outs of like, how does that conversation happen? Cause I've had plenty of mini tour guys and be like, yeah, you know, they don't really, do they ask you to come out or do you like say, Hey, if you're going to, we're going to work together, let's like put the, put a contract together for long term. Cause you know how fickle tour players can be. They can, sure. you know, next week they'll be listening to somebody else. Like how does that start? And then like, what was your first experience on tour and what, who was your first player? Well, my first, a professional golfer was Melinda Daniels Price, who is married uh, to a friend of mine, Rick Price. Rick Price, yeah, I know and, Rick. Yeah. yeah, and uh, Rick eventually became a client, and we ended up actually owning a business together. We st- we started a tropical smoothie together, and that Melinda was my first professional client, and she played the Symmetra Tour. And this is my answer to to, to when people ask me, "How do you start uh, coaching tour players?" Well, first of all, you have to start with one. Yeah. So you have to build a relationship with one. There's got to be some start, and then you got to have some success. I mean, without if you don't have success, the whole thing explodes or sure. implodes or well, you know, it just doesn't happen. So, 
Melinda had success and she actually won three times on the Symmetra tour and she graduated to the uh, LPGA tour. And uh, I would say that I was working out the sort of the semantics of how to w do that kind of relationship with her and then eventually with Rick. And so that I caddied for Rick and it, at certain events and it was still a work in progress. Like if I look back on that, I didn't not really have any kind of framework of what I was going to charge how I was going to cover expenses. And I, I still don't have a written contract with anybody. Really? You know, okay. I, and I get, and I get plenty of business people that, and I'm grad, I, I went to school for business. So I, I, but I, I, I get plenty of people that tell me you should have that. And I just don't, it just doesn't f sit right for me. Like mm -hmm. for me, everything is verbal and that if this is going to work, we're going to have a level of trust. So I started traveling a little bit more with him on then what was the nation. It might actually have not been the nationwide tour. It might have been even before that. Nike tour. <laughs> Nike, maybe, as far <laughs> yeah. back as Nike tour. Tells you how and, old both are. <laughs> right. I know. Like, I'm trying to think of what that was. Yeah. It was, yeah. Well, it was uh, buy.com in between there. Yep, so it that's actually right. might have been, been buy.com. And then it became nationwide. Mm -hmm. And um, then my real first professional. Um, PJ Tour client was Mike Spoza, who now works for Callaway Golf. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to my first PJ Tour event, which I, which I used it as a reference, the BC Open. And I remember this really clearly. I flew to, I think I flew to Scranton, Pennsylvania, to go and attend this event. And I had no idea what I was actually going to do there. Like I was just thinking, okay, what is this going to look like? Like I'm going to this event. We're going to wander around, and. I have a very clear idea of what that looks like now, but yeah. fifth or 16 years ago, I had no idea what that was going to look like. So we, uh, what I would frame now as we started prepping for this tournament and there was some communication with his existing caddy, but um, it was all pretty, whew, I'm not sure really exactly what happened then, you know, and <laughs> I have a great relationship with Mike. I have a great relationship with Cowboy Golf now and uh, Mike is still a great friend that uh, all of 16 years later. So um, that's really part of what I pride myself on is that whether I have existing clients or, or past clients, I, I pride myself on really having a good relationship with them. So that's kind of how that evolved. And then my exposo led to Richard S. Johnson um, mm -hmm. and then some time with Jesper Parnovic and then some time with Tom Gillis that is still going on and then Carl Peterson. And then when things start building momentum, then you start to get introductions and some work out and some don't. Sure. And there's an interview process that happens. And I right now, whether I'm looking back on that or whether I am even now thinking about how interviews might go, I'm not in a hurry to try to find or accumulate clients i want I, I like all of my relationships are i hope going to be good ones for both people and so i'm not really in a hurry to try to make that happen yeah i'm sure it's a balance right i mean you don't want to have too many like you know it's my buddy scott hamilton i don't know how he juggles yeah i don't know he how he does so that, many actually, players it. yeah it's like yes. he, and I, you know, Mark Blackburn, we've talked a lot about teaching tour players and like two or three is kind of a good number. <laughs> yeah. Like I can, have three PGA tour players yeah. now and I have a great relationship with all three. And at one time I had five and I, I'm not sure whether that was the best balance. And yeah. so they get, I they get jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I try to work a model now that I'm diversified. So I've got um, some good junior golfers and right up through college and up at various levels. And I suppose if I do a good job and, and, things happen where I, they graduate up to the upper levels. I'll deal with that when that happens. But, um, it, it is always a blend, like a blend of your home life and how much you'd like to, to travel. Like there are, uh, there are people that travel a lot and, sure. um, that, that is their own thing. I, I, I try to work the balance for me. So when did you meet Daniel? Cause he obviously is probably your most famous client. I would, I would say at this mm -hmm. point, talk about yeah. that relationship a little bit. I think that's pretty uh, fascinating. I met him when he had just moved to the Jupiter area. He had grown up in Key Biscayne, and he was 14, almost 15. And he was referred for, to me um, for some putting stuff when I was at Jupiter Dunes uh, from the head pro at the Dive Preserve at the time, um, Matt. And it... Um, 
it just started out as just kind of like that normal kind of lesson format. Like, mm -hmm. okay, we'll, we'll see how this goes. And then I met with his father uh, and him um, to kind of see if we'd make this a little bit more formal as far as coaching was concerned. And that was uh, a framework that his dad was very familiar with from the tennis world. And it evolved from there. Because at that time, Jan Daniel was just a pretty good junior golfer in Palm Beach County. You know, he had, he had lost to... I think I better get this right, otherwise he's going to give me crap over this. I think he'd lost to Gary Nicholas in the finals of the Palm Beach County Amateur. Mm -hmm. And he had played pretty good um, in some junior tournaments. And so it was just like meeting a good junior golfer at the time, really. Because um, people ask me that now, like, did you know? Did you know? Right, that was well, what I was going to say. I, when, I, I, when do you know like, that there could be a possibility that they're going to be able to play on tour? Um, I, it's tough, I didn't right? Know that. I, I can be honest. I didn't know that when he was in college, really. I mean, yeah. I knew that he was pretty good and he played pretty well at various points in college. But I, you don't know. You, you, you just yeah. know. Like for me, I, is this person getting better? Are they, are they evolving in situations where their skills are being tested? And are they embracing the competitive nature of it? Do they like that environment? Do they... And do they like all of it? Do they like the travel? Yeah. Do they like the adversity? Do they like the, do they keep getting back up? Like, because they're going to get knocked down a bunch. So do they keep getting back up again? And certainly Daniel keeps getting back up again. Yeah. And I, I think he's, from what I've heard, you know, we'll kind of talk about a few of our mutual friends, you know, John Graham that worked with his putting a little bit, or maybe still does a yeah. little bit. He described him as one of the most competitive players that he's ever ever worked with i mean there, there's something about that innate ability to like you said just compete and to be tough and you know the the heart and all that stuff you can't really measure i'm sure and it sounds like he has that right yeah yeah and to be able to channel that in a way that it doesn't become destructive because sure. I, other really incredibly competitive people can get so frustrated so quickly that it becomes a hindrance like they they're just so impatient and i would say that there is a balance of in that for everybody who has that nature and uh, his parents um, nurtured that in him. They, they yeah. did not, they did not see that as abnormal. They tried to do everything they can. And that was one of the determining factors, the main determining factor when his dad talked about his uh, sports developments uh, in anything, was he competing? Was he putting in the effort? Uh, the benchmark was that did he, was he doing things that he saw improvement? more long-term than short-term mm -hmm. and and that was the only thing that mattered it wasn't that didn't matter about winning or losing it didn't matter about really the scores that he shot it just was were you competing till the end yeah and i think and everybody probably wants to know and this is where I, again I, I think your coaching is is brilliant is the ability to assess a player's results and we'll get into like your consulting piece as well with all the people that you've, you've basically allowed your players to, to work with and, and measure. But how do you know, like when to leave some funky things alone in their golf swing? Right. Cause I mean, obviously, I mean, I, I love, I think it's beautiful. Like, I mean, a good coach is going to look at it and go, that's super functional, but it's like for the young coaches that listen to the show, it's like, how do you, how do you look at Daniel Berger and go, all right, May, I'm going to leave that little laid off position at, at the top alone, or I'm going to change it. Like talk us through the process of like when you've seen them. And I know I, I guarantee his swing has changed over the years. You know, people look at funky swings and go, Oh, he just left him alone. There's no chance. I guarantee you guys have done some stuff. So talk a little bit about what you're working on with them and that whole piece about changing or not changing funky spots. Right. So there is, the, the, there's lots of diagnosis tools that are out there right now. Um, there's been serious advancements in the tools available to diagnose golf swings from how more specific the camera has gotten uh, right on up through force plates and 3D and on and on and on. So uh, I am trying very hard to diagnose or deal with the difference between what might look a certain way and what is actually a certain way and what fits what are the pieces that fit what do they fit relative to performance and not necessarily cosmetics so the in the situation with daniel um i get often asked you know did you ever think about 
changing that position at the top? Well, yes, probably about 5,000 times. <laughs> Good. Thank, thank you for saying time, that. <laughs> all the time I'm looking about, is this relevant? Is this relevant that this thing that is very visible, is this a flaw? Is this something that is going to hinder this person's progress? Does it match? Does it match um, the other things that are going on? So a relevant visual reference for me was Lee Trevino. Okay, so someone who had a similar bowing of the wrist, the, the way the club is closed, the laid off look that matches um, the ulnar deviation that is going with uh, bowing the wrist yeah. and changing the relative position of the shaft without getting into too many technical aspects. No, but feel free. But yeah. Okay. So the, the <laughs> idea that that's, that, that's that the idea of this way, show. <laughs> and, and it looks that way because his wrist and his arm is doing that. So, First of all, I am trying to do a cost benefit analysis. Is it more beneficial to change this in the effort of making this someone better long term or even short term? But what are the costs? Well, the costs are that there's the possibility this person gets really bad for a while. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do they come out the other side of this and get better? Um, well, certainly there is a possibility with that. Um, so the you know, in other situations, I've used the example of Jim Furyk or sure. even other clients like mine, like Will McKenzie. If anybody knows Will McKenzie golf swing, you know, he has a very um, weak left hand. Yeah, or wide open a, club a left, face. Yeah, wide open club face. Yep. Again, do people ask me, do you ever think about changing his grip? Yes, probably about <laughs> 5,000 times, you know, and I, but, but the consequences of that affect the rate in which or in the what he does currently to close the club face mm -hmm. so there is a very late twist of the club in will mckenzie's case in daniel's case the the axle velocity graph or the rate of twist of the shaft never looked out of ordinary there was never a problem so then that was where okay this is a cosmetic thing mm -hmm. it balances some of the other things what is his ball control like well he always has demonstrated very good ball control um he he, it was never an issue where it was a hindrance to his performance. So then it just never became something that was relevant. Um, the, the amount of lateral movement that Daniel Berger has in his, uh, in his specifically in his pelvis was something that we worked on or, or continue to work on or, um, or in, the, in the, the current relationship that we are sh I'm sharing with Cameron McCormick because Cameron McCormick is part of Daniel Berger's life. Just like John Graham has been part of yeah, Daniel Berger's like, or David Orr, or John Sinclair, or on and on, or Brad Faxon, or Mike Weir, or on and on and on. The taking in of the of information and being able to put it as part of um, a player's formula and making all that work so that they can perform in competitive situations. So that's that's what we're after here. Yeah, and that, so it's, I'm going to sort of dissect that a little bit, and this, is, this may come out wrong, I don't know, but this is, this is so intriguing. So it's sort of the toughest time, I would guess, in that situation, because I've dealt with the same thing with kids and college players and you know professionals or whatever, is when you see something that's a little funky, it's like when you have those down times where they start striking it poorly – Yes. And then, then you start doubting yourself a little bit, right? So it sounds sure. like it, and that sort of leads me into, and we can circle back to this too, because again, this this is really this is really cool. And I wanted to read something off your website because this is what really sort of drew me to the way you coach. And and the first time I think I heard your name was from John Sinclair, as he said, "You," he, he's like, "Yeah, Jeff's been bringing um, Daniel to me for." for to get measured like every year since he was like, I don't know when you, whenever you start, it's a long time, right? So, we have 10 years of, of 3d data. Yeah, exactly. Data yeah. So like I thought that was, I mean, how, how smart is that? Right. So when you, and you mentioned, you know, some of those, those, that terminology of like, all right, the ball flight, you know, he's, it's very functional. He's got good control. And then you started seeing some key indi key indicators, and that's sort of what I would like to go down as well. Is like, what are the key indicators to not make a change like that? And it sounds like you're mixing, obviously, just sort of old school, you know, ball control. Let's let face it, that's what mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. With the information that John's giving you, based on 3D data, which is the real. Yes. Right? So, so what have you learned? And I was always kind of like, did you know 
like how to read graphs and about 3D data before you started working with John? Or has that sort of been a process of like, let's take them to this guy that can measure everything and then let's sort of learn as we go along about what's good and what's not good? Well, my first exposure to 3D was um, seeing some of the TPI graphs. And uh, Jeff Banizak started a, a, a service on tour, on the PGA Tour, called Back Nine Fitness. And he was using John Sinclair as one of his advisors. And he was doing, as part of the, pro the program that he was selling, was a 3D analysis. And at that time, one of my clients, Tom Gillis, signed up to work with Back Nine Fitness. And that's when I met John Sinclair. And I had seen some 3D analysis through the, not just the TPI, but I'd heard about Phil Cheatham and AMM. And I had uh, seen some presentations by Mike Duffy from Penn State about more accurate measurement. But I would say that it was just more that I knew it was out there and it had a lot more to do with university testing. Mm -hmm. And I was still very skeptical or apprehensive about the actual real world applications of this information. So John and my relationship and friendship with John started then like, okay, I'm want to catch up here. Like I, John's been using this for a while. That led me to then having a relationship with Phil Cheatham. Cause I thought, okay, I'm going to go to the dude that wrote the program for right. this sure. and then uh, hang out with him and then also send data to him. So I, we would measure, send the data to him and I would just say, you tell me what you see. And then that turned to, into part of what forms my model now about collaborating, like which is what you'll see on my website about yeah. like at, like getting these people to offer an opinion. And I'm still open to that. So if anybody is listening to this podcast and is wants to be part of a collaboration, I am still open to that possibility because I want, in some ways, to be challenged, and I want my mind to be open to what. Um, is not only available in measurement, but perspective. And that has led me to people like John Graham and David yeah. Orr and on and on and on the other people that are on there, including yeah. workout people, trainers. So John, um, pretty convincingly, if you've talked to John Sinclair, he Absolutely. can be pretty convincing at times about <laughs> yeah. the difference between between real and feel and you know what is an accurate measurement and you know maybe the comparison in certain measurement devices. But, um, and, the difference in how it looks on two-dimensional video or what your eyes see compared to what 3D motion measurement. And so I, as a result of that, started measuring the players that I worked with, with being open-minded to the opinion. So at that time, John would write a report, a really detailed report, not yeah. with the intent of creating a plan for improvement, but this is what's going on. Right. Yeah. And so then trying to get these pieces to match. Like, does this one thing match this other thing? And um, at around that time, I was working with some some golfers with some idiosyncrasies in their golf swings. Carl Peterson, yeah. uh, Jesper Parnovic, uh, Will McKenzie, Daniel, um, uh, several others that were in that category. And, that, and so the idiosyncrasies were what I could see visually, but I wanted to know more about what the actual movement was, and that's where... John is still a really big part of my life. And uh, Phil still consults. Uh, there's Jason Meesh, who I just saw actually coincidentally ran into him when we were doing some motion capture up at uh, Dave Lebert Academy in Orlando recently. Um, yeah. I have a great relationship with Tyler Farrell. I was going to say, Tyler Farrell, he, he's been on the show and he's, I know he's learned a lot from John and John Tattersall, another guy. Yes, guy. absolutely. I, John Tattersall is a fantastic friend of mine. Just yeah. saw him at the PGA show. We, uh, you know, we have uh, some sarcastic banter at pretty much every time that <laughs> oh, we yeah. see one another. Yeah. Yes. And and Mark Blackburn, um, I would consider Mark a friend, both our relationship on tour. Um, and then that led me to a relationship that I have with Chris Como uh, through the Dallas connection and then on and on and on how things um, kind of went from there. And so I, I, I value those relationships because – not only are those people potentially looking at things differently from their own coaching perspective, but I, I just like the idea that we can connect on this level, like we're having this conversation mm -hmm. and catch up like, uh, yeah. or, or look at things differently. Like the, the idea that I, I don't want to get stuck in a, in my lane. 
I want to be challenged in being able to get out to get out of my lane. Yeah, it's such a great mindset. It's a, it's such a such a great approach. I mean, as you say on the website, I firmly believe that building a team of professionals with whom you're able to consult is essential to being the most effective coach you can be. So it's it goes both ways, right? So you're helping your player, plus you're also learning from the information that's you know that you're getting from the 3D and the holistic approach that you're that you're taking. And uh, my favorite part was it's not about me and my ego. It's about giving the player the best opportunity for success. But in my other, my next question would be, how does the player respond to that? Because I think a lot of coaches, and I probably were, was like that maybe in my younger days, was a little bit guarded to say, I don't want to reach out to somebody else because I feel like my player is going to think I don't know everything. Like, you know, I would say that the good, the good players, the smart learners out there are going to say, I really appreciate my coach taking that extra step to make sure everything, every, every stone is unturned. Yeah. And there's a balance in that. It depends on the level of the client that you're working with. Mm -hmm. Like you, we're talking about people who are either playing for their livelihood or intend to play for their livelihood. Um, if you're starting out on this, I, uh, the, the journey of working towards working with better and better players there's a there's a balance in having enough knowledge that you can speak confidently about something and then also knowing what your limits are and the having the right relationship with your clients regardless of whether you've seen them one time or 11 years to be able to explain the reason why you're doing it because then it's really then it's not seen i mean i I believe, or I, 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 and I might be wrong in some of the reading of the relationships that I've had in the past, but I don't really see that it, it's necessarily a, a, a lack of knowledge, that you, you're open enough that you're going to get the right answer, the yeah. best answer that's available at the time. And from a selfish perspective, that, that's what's led to me being able to have all these relationships. I'm not yeah. really that open a person like i i'm i would probably classify myself as an introvert and i i was traveling out on tour and i was thinking okay like i'm wasting this time i'm i'm traveling i'm hanging out with the people that i already have a relationship with it was a concerted effort for me to meet people so i remember very clearly i had dinner with with chris como at the byron nelson Oh, I don't know, maybe eight years ago. He probably maybe, I don't know whether he remembers more than me, but we, we, you know, we went out and I was, I remember, you know, this is when he was still um, finishing up his degree, uh, his doctorate in degree in biomechanics yes. with uh, Dr. Kwan mm -hmm. at uh, Texas uh, Women's University. Yeah. And he was wanting to get more into coaching and, you know, it, it's kind of seems silly now where people know Chris Como, but at the time, you know, he was just like doing his thing and, and, and we, I reached out to him and we had dinner or I had dinner last week with uh, Ramon Bisconza, who who built the perfect putter. Mm -hmm. and I've known Ramon for a while when he played, but I just was like, I want to get to know this guy better. Now, this is not my personality, really. Like, this is a concerted effort for me to say, hey, would you like to go out to dinner? And you got to put yourself out there. It's almost like asking for a date. Yes. And you're not sure whether this person is just going to go, uh, nope, not interested. But, you know, fortunately enough for me, I think I've got better at the asking. And so... I like last week I had uh, or two weeks ago when I was in Palm Springs and I hope to do the same again when I'm in Pebble here um, have what probably are considered to be business dinners or meetings. But really what they are is in an effort to build a relationship with the full understanding that this might not be something that I agree with. Like it's not always the idea that I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, this is totally dig what this person is saying. Because that's not the intent. Yeah. The intent is that I want to keep my mind open and I want to, I may be totally into how this person is actually communicating. I may not totally agree with their methodology, but that's okay. I, I, I don't, this is the other thing that I would totally recommend to people who are wanting to do this more seriously or even with the idea that they might, they might coach at like higher levels. Go and take a lesson yourself at least once a year. I like it. Yeah. The other really bizarre thing was go and take a lesson. If you're a right-handed golfer, take a lesson left-handed. Mm. That go. is really enlightening to go <laughs> and take a lesson left-handed to, to, to get an idea of what you like and what you don't like or what you what sounds good. or So that was one of the other things that I started to do all the way along the way is I would just 
go and do that. That's that's gold right there, my friend. Like everything you just said, because I mean, we we come from similar sort of backgrounds and introvert. I'm a trained extrovert, right? I mean, and, yeah. There we, you go. That's I've, a good phrase. Yeah, and I and I've talked about that a lot on this podcast. I'm not going to bore you about it, but I was from the same. You know, I was shy, and, and and again, it's like if you're going to move in a direction towards whatever goal you have or, or whatever career you have, you got to sort of get out of that comfort zone. So one of the questions that I always like to dive into, and this would be interesting to hear your perspective, is when you're developing and you start to become a top teacher, I sort of divide what we do into two segments, which is IQ versus EQ, right? IQ being the information stuff and then the EQ being all the other, the self-awareness, the empathy, the bedside manner, the building the relationships. It's like, where did that come from for you? Because you obviously have that in spades, the EQ part. The IQ, you know, you, we've all sort of developed and it's available to us now. But it's like, I think the EQ part is really what separates good coaches from great coaches. So for you, was it was it something in your childhood? Was it your parents? Was it because you just, you just mentioned that you basically had to get out, out of your comfort zone and go have dinner with somebody you don't know. And then somebody that maybe doesn't even agree with you, that's a difficult thing. Like, how does that develop? Can it be trained, I guess? <laughs> um, can it? Uh, well, I think, well, for me, I didn't need to work on it. And I like your description. The, that, that is a very accurate description to how I tend to think. Like, how, how are you balancing the acquisition of knowledge? And then how are you applying it? So the application of that knowledge so um how how would i well the influences in my life i mean I'm, I'm fortunate enough to come from two parents that were teachers so my dad was a, a physical education teacher and my mom was actually a special ed, special education teacher and in canada that meant that she meant she dealt with both the with the children that were learning disabled and gifted so she had to she part of her job was to go into classrooms and help the the teacher deal with the gifted kids and develop and change the programs for them as well as for the, the, the learning handicapped, disabled challenged kids. And so I have been able to use them as a, a sounding board for things that make sense. One of the other things that I did, which was uh, really the advice of my wife is when we were looking for people to work at our junior golf camp. And at the time when Tiger was really on top of the world, our junior golf camp had 220 kids in it. And we broke that up into groups of about 60 kids that would show up in the morning and 60 kids in the afternoon. And we do two sessions of that. And I, this is uh, not hopefully offending anybody, but we, we found out that the golf pros that we were hiring weren't very good at it. They were good at the information, but not good at the EQ part. There you go. So, so um, I hired some physical education teachers from the area, and their IQ golf-wise was not very good. I just figured I would teach them that, but their EQ was fantastic. And they, we ran all of these scenarios off of them about what do you think about this drill? What do you think about this environment? They would even tweak things like, okay, well, what's the intent here? Well, the intent is that we want these kids to be better at chipping. So rather than having a line of eight kids, we just had four different stations with two kids, which seems mm. simple enough, but you keep the kids all active yeah. and you actually have the, the two kids there working as a team rather than the line of eight kids waiting to hit their two pitch shots. So there was that kind of information over the course of several years that, uh, really made me think about the, to use your term again, the EQ part, mm -hmm. like, it, like how am I getting this information? And, and kids are merciless when it comes to whether you got them or not. Yes. I mean, you oh, can yeah. tell immediately whether you got them, whether you, you can tell it in their body language and their eyes, um, whether you've grabbed their attention. And I, I use that same information. Now I can tell when I've lost somebody, like I'm talking too much or I'm, I'm not connecting to them. I'm mm -hmm. reading their body language and I can tell, okay, man, I got to, I got to change this up because this person is not digging what I'm saying. You can, you can read it now. How that, how you're reading that? Well, that just comes from the experience of seeing it in junior golfers, yeah. seeing it in situations, um, certainly making mistakes. Yeah, uh, for sure. Paying it, paying attention, right. When it doesn't work and then 
yeah trying to not do the same thing again yeah and i yeah. i'm a big fan of 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 filming what you're doing I um, like it. Yeah. and it's hard it's hard to see oh man i look like that or man <laughs> i really don't like that body language or man i'm sure. i'm way too i'm i'm talking too much here like or i'm i'm i don't sound i don't sound convinced so how is it that I'm, how is it, how is I'm going to convince this person? I love My it. body language and my, my way of describing this doesn't sound very convincing. So that's a real hard lesson. If you film yourself doing it, or if you do some live lessons intentionally, um, where you, like I used to do this when I was over at Jupiter Dunes and I would ask the people come out and, hey, watch me doing this thing, which was incredibly uncomfortable for me. But I want you to give me critical feedback. Let me know what it sounds like I'm doing. And man, you get some, you get some tough lessons when you get that. Yeah, You're just amen. like, Ooh, well, yeah. <laughs> so you, you, by going through that place, not only does it help you, I think with your style, but it also opens you up to the idea that this is okay. This is all right to, to receive this. And then that's also, I started doing this, I would say maybe 10 to 12 years ago. Part of the follow up would be, I would either email the, the, my client or uh, phone them and I'd say, I want you to give me your takeaways. Tell me what you left with. Well, that can be pretty shocking as well. Like the intention that you had and what they took yeah. away is like, woo, wow, that wasn't really what I was <laughs> after at all. So, and I, I wanted to always phrase it by saying, like, this isn't a test. This is really more about me than it is for you. And I, mm -hmm. I would like you to answer this as honestly as possible because it helps both of us. And so when you ask somebody, like I call you up and let's say we've hung out, you know, hey, Jason, you know, this is just me with my follow up call. This is part of what I was talking about. And you say, you know, I, well, this is my was my takeaway. This is my main takeaway. And you think in your head, wow, that wasn't really what I was intending <laughs> at all. Yeah, that that, yeah. That, 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 that starts to formulate your how you how you how you format the time. Yeah, that that that's that's outstanding. And that kind of leads me into to my next question about, you know, mentoring young, young coaches, right? So it's like, what would you, if a young coach came up to you and said, Hey, you know, what, what I want to learn from you, but what would you suggest that I, I should do to get better at teaching or coaching? Whether it would be, I'm, I'm, I'll just kind of leave that open. Cause this is a, this is a big part of this podcast is, is helping some of these young coaches out there to, to get better. We want to leave, we want to leave the the teaching game a little bit better, and like you said, there's a lot of a lot of uh, teachers out there that aren't doing such a great job. Like if you were <laughs> another way to, to I guess well, well, let me phrase, back up here. I, yeah, I, I don't want to say that. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, that's that. That's not my intent. That, no, 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 no. But it's, doing, it's reality. Good I mean, job. Like yeah. yeah, it's. Um, and I apologize for interrupting, but that's not the no. intent here. Like that's uh, it's. I am doing my best to describe my journey here and the yeah, and yeah. the intent is not to say this person is doing it wrong because i think the intent is always good i mean people don't enter into this with bad intention absolutely yeah you totally know the agree. intent is good just is that intent reaching um the ears of the client in a way that maximizes the the possible good outcomes. I yeah, mean, that's yeah. really what we're after here. Yeah. And I don't think anybody took it that way. It's just, I, I'm just, so the point is, is like, what advice would you give a young, whether it's a PGM student that comes out and says, I want to be a teacher or just a young coach in general says, I just want to get better. Like what's that blueprint look like in your opinion? Well, I think that, uh, what is very helpful is that you have a systematic approach of being able to do an evaluation and have a way to take that information that you gathered, whether it's through various tools, um, eyes, camera, track man, or some kind of uh, radar, um, and then we could get more sophisticated from there. But the, mm -hmm. the idea that you gather some information, uh, I think it's really important to gather information and talking to the person. Like, first of all, ask them, well, you know, why are they here? Because you know, so, sometimes we can get so caught up in like trying to figure stuff out, we don't even ask the person why they're here in the first place. <laughs> yeah. So what? So no. So why? Why are they here in the first place? Take this information and then come up with uh, a simplified plan. Like this is a direction. This is a, this is the way we're going to go, and then be confident enough in that direction that you're going to let it play out. 
because I think that in my experience personally and then also listening in or when I talk to people who have who started out a little earlier, you you either aren't confident enough in the direction that you've chosen or you don't let it play out. And so this is where I get into medical analogies. You know, so I, uh, you know, we all live in this world of analogies because that's just sort of how the whole thing kind of works with golf. But if I'm using a medical analogy, you got to have enough confidence in your initial diagnosis and your prescription. And then you got to have enough confidence and enough time and let that prescription play out. In medicine, if you're too quick to add another prescription, you don't know which one worked. You don't allow the enough time to be able to say this didn't work. It's a great point. So this you you and that's hard. That's a difficult thing when yeah. someone is struggling. Patience. Okay, you know, but <laughs> to right, let them the to let them suck, as we say. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Right. No, you really. Gotta, you gotta, yeah. and, and they might be just working it out. Sure. They're just they're just you, you've decided this is the way to go. Mm-hmm. You um they've come to you and they they wanna they wanna stop slicing. They it's so, all right, so they've got to have a path change. Okay. And they maybe have heard this before, and this is the same direction that uh, 10 other people have said them that this is the direction they're going to go. And so you're, you're convinced that this is the thing that's going to help them. You're going to make a path change. Well, you got to have enough confidence that the advice that you're giving is going to play out. And if you rush in there with more advice, which is probably the single biggest thing that I see with people who are new, uh-huh. they don't have the patience to let it play out. And now they've got another pill and then another pill, and that person is getting more and more frustrated, and then now you're lost. You're not sure which one of these things is going to work, and you're grasping, and so be able to have, and this is where Mike Adams is really good. Mike Adams has really changed the way that coaching has uh, has been has been taught and teaching has been taught, and I give a lot of respect to Mike um, because his diagnostic approach, whether you agree with it or not, sure. has changed the way that um, people have been trained to, and, and TPI is a big part of that as well, mm-hmm. with their functional movement screen. They brought a functional movement screen to golf, something that is fairly easy and quick to uh, apply to a student to see whether it's possible for them to move that way. So if you're advising someone to change their path to more draw, it's logical that to figure out whether they can actually move that way. Whether it's impossible for them to move that way is probably a failed um, diagnosis. So um, that's where th- that has changed the changed the the framework in which people should be thinking about how do how am I going to go about prescribing this thing, and then having. I mean, I've said this a few times, but having enough confidence and enough belief that, okay, I'm going to let this play out. Yeah, I think that, and that also, I think, brings the importance of something you mentioned earlier was having a long-term relationship, right? So having, the, you know, because the whole, the old paradigm is like that one-off lesson, you know, right? The band-aid of like, oh, let's yeah. just, you know, let's, let me give you a couple things. And that's why I've gone to unlimited lessons the last couple of years, and it's really changed one, like the structure of my lessons, because now I can take my time. Plus you have a, you have a student that in there in front of you, that's willing to have some patience, you know, and, and we prom, I, I can promise you in, in a year, this is what's going to look like if we have the patience to make this one change and it may make, you know, a couple of, couple of weeks or whatever, instead of, you know, throwing, you know, like I said, throwing the band aid on it. So it, I think hopefully we're moving in that direction Right. Because that's what, you know, with Mike stuff, I think it's great. But it's like the old the old one hour or half hour lessons, like how am I have time to like measure all this stuff and then actually administer yeah. some kind of, you know, application? Like, I think, does that make sense? Of course it does. Well, there's that old yeah. joke, you know, yeah. and I, 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 the idea that, you know, it's posted on the wall that five lessons are, let's say they're $400 and one lesson is a thousand. And the guy says, <laughs> yeah. well, why is the lesson a thousand? Well, if you expect miracles, you're going to have to pay for it. <laughs> there you you go. know, that's, that, that, that's yeah. the, that's the old joke of, that is really, it, it, it was a joke, but now it's very applicable. The Absolutely. idea that if you expect a miracle and in, and I, I now, in retrospect, have thought about lots of situations where I'm in a in an hour lesson that's defined by an hour, 
And there's this internal clock that's going inside me like, ooh, wow, you know, like, okay, I'm running out of time here. Things aren't going well. I better, <laughs> you know, like you, you, you have, and, and as soon as you open it up to the idea that this is a, this is a longer term, whether it's multiple lessons or there's going to be some supervised practice or there's going to be a timeline to this, not only does it not feel like that there's a, a stopwatch inside you, there's not a stopwatch inside the person. There you go. Like, okay, like I yep. don't need to get this. I don't, because whether we recognize it or not, that person is feeling a certain amount of pressure to perform for you anyway. Mm -hmm. They're there. So I think about that all the time when someone shows up in my hitting, the hitting bay and we got the bright lights on and we, you know, we can fire up all this stuff. This person is not feeling comfortable. You know, even if they play golf for a living, you know, yeah. like the first time, like if I'm meeting, let's say, Von Taylor comes to see me. You know, I have a great relationship with Von Taylor now that's going on almost three years. So Von Taylor comes to see me, and you know, part of that might be that I'm all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna represent that I know what I'm doing, that I I'm in a nice facility, and I'm gonna fire up my hitting bay, and I got all this stuff there. Well, Von Taylor is not gonna feel very comfortable in that. You know, even if he's played golf, you know, Von is in his 40s now, mm -hmm. you know, played our Ryder Cup, won multiple times. You know, he's gonna feel like he's in a laboratory. Like this is, and we jokingly call that at the Dive Preserve, you know, the shred building, you know, in the shred building, you know, like, and, and that's the joke, but we're not, we don't want it to be that. Yeah. We're not shredding people in there, but that's the perception. Like you go in there and the lights come on and, or even if someone, you break out your camera, even if it's simply an iPhone now, the idea is that they're, you're analyzing them. So they're feeling uncomfortable and they want to perform for you. And if there is this defined timeline I, you know, and I, I have been there and, you know, like the time's running out and boy, I hope I get a good one here. We want this guy to get a good one. Yeah. You know, I want this, I want this medicine to show me that it's working. But if you extend that out, then there is this less, it's calmer. It's just not, doesn't have that thing hanging over it. Yeah. What are, what uh, technology are you using currently? Most, uh, most of your lessons, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, 3D annually and semi-annually at times. Um, I don't own one on purpose. I was going to say, that's, like, that's, your, that's where you go to see John, right? Yeah, or John comes to me okay, or, gotcha. uh, or Tyler. You know, Tyler's AMM system is not functioning properly, so that's uh, we couldn't do it this year. Um, and I've had a couple situations where I've had John, Tyler, and I'm going to probably involve Sasha McKenzie in this at some point. Yeah. Um, it just hasn't worked out for me because I – like what Sasho has to say in the applications of it. Um, I'll send the data to various people. So we use 3D, but it's on more on an annual or semi-annual basis. Yeah. And then in the hitting bay, we have we have TrackMan, and we've got multiple cameras running, uh, fixed cameras. And I this last PGA show, I am right on the threshold of buying force plates. Which and one? I'm trying to just... Uh, gasp probably. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, and I'm going to lower my voice here so that my wife doesn't freak out because when that check hits our <laughs> bank account, it's probably not going to be this great thing. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, this is the other great thing about owning or knowing somebody like John Sinclair, you know, he's basically like my myth buster. Mine too. <laughs> Before right. I buy so, anything, I just call him. <laughs> uh, yes. Right. So, you know, do you know the, the TrackMan story with John Sinclair? Do you, no, do no. You know when, to, so totally. when John bought a TrackMan back when it was very early on, he had a ballistic expert from the Dallas-Fort Worth Police Department come out, and they were shooting golf ball through tissue paper to verify TrackMan's numbers. Oh, God. <laughs> so that's, that's so what John classic. does. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So or John James Lights. Yeah, yes, you know, or James Lights. Yeah. So those guys are good people to know to see yeah. whether – this is a valid purchase or not Whether, like because we, we were all at that point where okay is it valid to buy a track man at what <laughs> point is it really worth it to spend this money like how how often am i going to use this yep. i mean it seems like a silly question right now um but it was very valid 10 to 12 years ago to figure out okay am i going to buy a track man because at that point it had a lot more to do with fitting golf and people using it for training or 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 practicing was it really was not that big a deal. It, it was not something that was like we we're still trying to figure out. Okay, um, what what is what is the relevance of this information? Am I going to help people by giving this information? Right. Um, that um, it does seem laughable now, but I mean uh, back then it certainly seemed like that. Um, so force plates for me are is the next purchase, and um, the. I have a body track, Matt, that um, 
I don't use that often anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, like the the balancing between what I see in two dimensional video. So our cameras are 220 frames per second, and everything's trying to keep up with an iPhone now, pretty sure. much. Um, and uh, iPhone the, is, the my, is I, my cameras now, actually. That's what yeah, I use as okay. cameras. Uh, the camera that I use probably more than any other is the above camera, the one that's directly above to see release patterns. And then balancing balancing that off with uh, what I see in the actual velocity graph in 3D or in stuff with rate of closure. Because uh, I'm trying to balance the engine with the steering wheel. So mm-hmm. that's my analogy in the car. How is this person steering, steering the car? And what is the face-to-face relationship? And how are they producing power? What's the what is the engine of this? And do these things do they do they conflict? Yeah. Um, does the person have the control that they are wanting uh, to match the level of their expectation? And is the engine adequate enough to? And first of all, not going to hurt them uh, or increase the likelihood of injury. And is it? Uh, and this is where it matches with force plates. Yeah, we're I was at this say, point you, now. You almost have to have you know the knowledge of what's going on with the ground. Yeah. forces and torques of the ground to, to kind of maximize yeah. that. Yeah. You're, you're right on the money. That's yeah. Right. And, and to this point, just, I would say in the last six months, I have resisted buying force plates because I have not seen an, uh, a clear pattern that I can apply. No. I, I, and, and I believe in the world of measurement, we've got to a point where they're, we're dealing with sequence or whether we're dealing with, um, the application of that information. That's just my own personal opinion. I think probably the people at Swing Catalyst or at GASP or at S2M would yeah. would contradict me on that, but that's just my own opinion. I feel like we're at the point now uh, in my in my life where um, I can, and I've had some good conversation. I had a really good conversation a week ago with Mark Blackburn about that because Mark's been using a gas plate, the plates for the two plates for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, that it's it's now come to that for me. Yeah. Smart to move. That's when I was working with James lights at the show. He does, you know, use the, the dual force plates mm-hmm. pretty strong. Yeah. The, I mean, I mean, they're expensive, they, they, but I mean, if you're going to do it, if you're going to go the whole bowl of wax, that's pretty, pretty good way to go. Yeah. Uh, they, they use the, they use Geislers, I think, uh, uh-huh. that are uh, made in Switzerland, I believe. And then, uh, gas are the, uh, AMTIs, I believe, which are, they're the same thing. They're the two plate systems and, yeah. um, I, I, I am apprehensive uh, both for a combination of the financial commitment, but also I want to make the right choice on how this is going to play out over the next five to 10 years. Sure. Yeah. Look like long-term. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, I, I don't want to be on the BlackBerry side of this uh, choice. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> just, just, I'm going to use a Canadian that, example. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Not many people know about BlackBerry anymore, but I don't want to be on the BlackBerry chi- side of this yeah. choice. I like I, it. I, would wa- I, I want to be on the iPhone side of this choice. <laughs> oh, sp- speaking of that, is, has there ever been like looking through your career, has there ever been like a failure or, a lo- or like a roadblock in your life that set you up for later success? Because I know we mentioned fa- failures early on. It's like it's important to not be afraid to fail, because you know, again, if we pay attention and we try not to make the same mistakes, is there any story that you could share with the coaches out there? Sure. Uh, and this is this is a story that has so far a good ending um, because it were it was a reconnect with a very good friend of mine, Tom Gillis. Um. So this this was a situation where. Uh, I reacted too much in an off season in a situation with um, uh, dealing with change and dealing with um, a motivated player that wanted to get better and not taking a, an objective enough opinion on that and probably being too, too close and not, not uh, removed enough from the situation that in, in hindsight, I, should have acted and reacted differently. But um, as a result of that, our relationship is uh, stronger than it's ever been, both personally and professionally. So 
the moral of that story is to do your best to remain objective. Like it's really good to have empathy and bedside manner, but the real goal of a good doctor and a good relationship in a coaching environment, in my opinion, is that you don't lose objectivity. You don't lose um, the ability to be able to take a step back and see where is this leading? Like, where is, where is this going to go? Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the crystal ball. That's the, that's really I would say defines somebody who's um, good at balancing your IQ and your EQ. Yeah. Like um, like you have the knowledge, even if you're all even if your knowledge is, let's just give it a round number of fifty percent of where you want to be. How are you applying that in a way that um, you can see what are the how does this play out? How does this play out over time? And if you lose that objective opinion and you get caught up in it, uh, whether it's the emotion of someone wanting to do well, then, then you're not as good to the client and you're not as good to yourself. Um, you, that, that being, remaining objective is really what we, what we should be. Yeah, that's a great point. And thank, thank you so much for sharing that because I think it, a lot of it is like you've talked about ego, right? Or thing, things that sort of get in the way that, make or force us to make bad decisions. Uh, I was listening to a podcast with Jocko Willink. I don't know if you're her Navy SEAL guy. Yeah. And yeah, he, it's yeah, funny yeah. you say that because he made that point. He was talking about his leadership book, which I highly recommend out there to anybody. It's so basic, but it's like just some basic stuff is really what we need to hear. But he talked about taking literally in a, in a high pressure situation, which could be us coaching or it could be a player of taking a step back eight inches and just looking objectively at the situation and it becomes more clear. So, I mean, that's, that's like really, really well put. Well, thank you. Um, and I don't really know, I don't know whether you can get that without some, without some hindsight or without some experience. Sure. Like you, I, I don't, I, I, I think maybe you can get a little better at maybe seeing these situations coming. Um, I, I would say that it, it, my experiences or my mistakes w would have to come more from how I in communicated things or the intent or how they were probably misinterpreted, like the sure. misinterpretations. Yeah, communication. And yeah, the yeah. communication. And so I work really hard on whether it's follow up or just um, this is where the time comes in that the. Is this is this what I intended? Is this is this really the is this the direction with this relationship that I intended? And because the um, the part that you're connecting with the person, that empathy, that's 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 the part that I think really where you get the buy-in. Because um, yes. because that's what we're all after is this buy-in. And if if you're empathizing with somebody and you know um, you're representing. A position of experience and knowledge, but also the idea that you're going to remain objective in this. Then, then you're you're on the journey with them. You're not just judging them. You're not uh, imparting this information and then letting them be able to deal with it on their own. And uh, uh, Dr. Bob Rotella is a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and he's got this great analogy of uh, swimming across a river, um, and I just think that this is fantastic when it relates to like whether someone is is n sort of knowing the journey. The idea that you're going to swim across this river and at certain times it's going to be deeper and it's going to be uh, the current's going to be faster and that there's a significant difference in swimming across that river in daylight compared to the darkness. So our job is to shed light on the difficulty of swimming across this river. Our job isn't necessarily to take away the fact that it's going to be hard at certain times. But there's a difference between doing it in daylight comparing it to darkness. And so that analogy really resonates with me because if it, you're doing it at the dark, you may turn it back at some point when you're 10 yards from the other side. Oh, boy, this is really hard. It's getting deep and I'm getting tired. And that might actually cause drowning. Like you were literally 10 yards from the other side. But you didn't know because you were in the dark. So that's where I think good coaching comes in, that you're not trying to make it less hard. 
everything because there are times that it's hard. It, this is a hard sport. There is lots. I mean, part of this sport is dealing with adversity. That's the reason why business people want to take people on the golf course. They want to see how they how they how they react. Right. What what kind of what what is the true nature? You know, golf has been known for a long time as exposing people's true nature. Whether you cheat, whether you what kind of what what is what is the environment bring out of you? So if as a coach, if you're able to bring like turn the lights on a little, then that's where the journey gets a little easier. Mm, that's fantastic. I love it. So so how do you deal with your stress in your life? Like, do you have some daily habits that or some tactics that you go to when you feel overwhelmed or unfocused? Well, my day starts um, every day where um, I get up and I try to do um, a little bit of exercise. Um, and then it starts by preparing for the day. And, uh, you know, this is somewhat connected to Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Yeah. Um, but it is also just became sort of the fabric of what I do. So I get up early in the morning, I prepare. What time? And the combination. Um, is it the same time or for the very pretty much bit? every time now west coast that really messes me up sure. so i'm a 5 30 to 6 guy so on the west okay. coast that's 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 real early so i i'm not hoping to be pacing around carmel california at three in the morning next week but i i might be so if you happen to be out at carmel at three three <laughs> in the morning you might see me out there pacing around but um i i, I get up early and i um Write down. I'm still a write down person, and I have a file in all my for all my clients. So I write, and my wife is constantly telling me, you know, you can do this on your computer. Well, that's <laughs> not how my that's not how my mind works. You don't have a computer. So I, I don't have a computer. <laughs> I mean, I definitely have an iPad Pro, or I I, I, I could write my notes on my iPhone, but that's sure. not how my brain works. And I've just come to accept that. Like this is not how my brain works. So I write stuff down manually. I write down the notes from my previous day, the time that I spent with people, and I prepare for the people that I'm seeing today on that day. And I have either a lesson plan or I have a reference for what I'm going to be talking about. And it also refreshes my memory on what we've done before, because I hate telling stories that they've already heard or analogies they've already heard, or if I say something that doesn't, isn't applicable to them. So that I, don't, I wanted to do my best to not have that happen. So that sets my day up so that I don't feel as wound up to begin with. Lay it out. And, um, so that way, also, when I come home at night, with the exception of tonight, um, I am going to be there for my wife. I'm going to be, yes. like, engaged. I'm not going to be doing my whatever. My And um, so that, that morning starts that way. And um, the negative side of this is that I don't play much golf anymore. I kind of have lost my relationship with golf, and that's kind of a regret for me. So mm -hmm. I fish. So I go fishing okay. and uh, on like some of my days off, I go fishing and I like to fly fish and I'm fortunate enough to live in a part of the world where, you know, saltwater fly fishing is really good. And so that's kind of my getaway. So people ask me, you know, what do you do on your day off? Yeah. I, I really don't want to go play golf. So I, um, I go fishing. That's awesome. And I'm a big fisherman as well. I love that trout fishing with fly fishing. Yeah, I grew up so, trout fishing. Yeah. So, and I, and I, my, my wife's family is from Eastern Canada, and so we uh, trout fish up there. And I, it, it, I, I, uh, not so coincidentally, I try to connect fly fishing with uh, when I travel. So not next week, but you know, my favorite destination is Hartford every year because I stay really close to the Farmington River and I fish there every evening. So oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, I get the evening hatch in June, and then uh, I'll fish. Uh, well, I'll fish wherever I can. Uh, I fish yeah. in New Orleans, red fishing, and uh, I read I have red fish in Sea Island, Georgia. So I try to connect those things, um, and I try to do my best to turn my phone off, my turn my phone off, and mm. um, kind of check it out. And and if my relation, I hope my relationships are good enough that people understand that. You know, like this is sort of like and and most of my clients, if not all my clients, don't really communicate with me past probably 8 30 at night because they just kind of know that all right this is this is the downtime yeah kudos to that <laughs> well i thanks. don't have i don't have that down yet <laughs> no you don't <laughs> no <laughs> all you, you gotta build that in i know 24 7 i'm like yeah getting text messages and swing videos and whatnot so got it that's all right no that's that's brilliant man i love i love it i mean it's such a common theme what you just said is the daily habits and that's what i'm always really uh, interested in. And, and I think the listeners take a lot from that because 
there's a reason why people are successful and you just, I mean, you just put it very, very perfectly there. All right. So I got one more question. I really appreciate your time. I know we've, <laughs> this has been a process. That's and, okay. And I'm now you, now you kind of understand that, you know, the, 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 why these are long because it, this is the good stuff. All right. So if you could have, or if you could get a message to the world, okay. And put it on a gigantic billboard what would your message say and why? It doesn't have to be golf. I would rather it be life or just anything that you can think of. If you had to get that message to everybody in the world, put it on a billboard, metaphorically speaking, of course, what would sure. your billboard say? Well, it's hard for me to separate golf from this because we've been talking about golf. Yeah, and you can so, have multiple bill, multiple billboards, as I always say, too. <laughs> you can have a couple. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, the first one would be use less words. So think about the words that you're choosing and think about the message so that can you use, can you lose, can you use less words? And um, if you're into fly fishing and you know the River Runs Through It movie, Absolutely. are you familiar with that movie? Oh, yeah. Uh, Robert Redford. A hundred times, yeah. There's, yeah, there's a great part in that where um, a young version of the lead character is going in front of his dad and he's writing an essay. And his dad asks, says, asks him to use half the number of words. And half then he asks long. him, to, half as long. That's right. Half as long. Yep. So that, that not only resonates with me in golf, but in life. Like, how can I sit, how, how is it I can deal with this situation with half as many words? So then it makes it. me take, take the pause, think about what my intentions are, and then also how, how these words are going to land. How, how are they going to, are they going to land softly? Are they going to land hardly or hardly? Are they going to land <laughs> firmly? Are they going to, are they, are they, are they going to, what, what, how are these, what, how is this going to come across? And yeah. I think there's a balance in that with being inside your own head so that you're, you know, you do, you are a little impulsive. I, I would say certainly I'm not very impulsive. You know, I, I tend to probably err on the side or be on the side of being a little more analytical in my thinking or sure. thinking too much about things. Um, so that would certainly be my, the first billboard. And then the other one that we've already talked about is do your best to be objective. Love it. Um, yeah, it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to be subjective. I mean, you're in it. You're wrapped up. Um, so whether it's dealing with like you know personal hardships, um, and then also like to be kind and empathetic. You know, em empathy is a really great thing in life. You know, that's one of the things I've learned from my wife. You know, she's she's very empathetic. There's two things that I you know my my relationship with my wife is fantastic because she's she's very empathetic. She's also incredibly smart. You know, she has a really high IQ. So um, she challenges me on that use of those words. Mm -hmm. And um, she has a very low BS meter. So she her BS meter is going to go off pretty quickly, <laughs> which is uh, it's, it's good to be in that kind of environment yeah. for me because, like, I can just see that she's all right. You know, this is this isn't flying. This is not going to. So if I'm trying to negotiate this golf trip slash fishing trip, she knows She's read it. She already knows this is a fishing trip. Yeah. I was actually trying to negotiate that this year to go to Hawaii, and I'm glad I didn't because it blew like 40 miles an hour over there. Yeah. But I was thinking if I'm going to go back to Hawaii, I'm going to go fishing. I want to go bone fishing there. And uh, pretty quickly it was turning into a, a fishing trip and not a golf trip or <laughs> like a golf work trip. And yeah. my wife saw right through that. So I just ended up going to Palm Springs for the week. So I, there was no – It's not bad. There was no, there was no Hawaii for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's awesome, man. I, I I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation to finally get to meet you, uh, somebody that I've admired, you know, from afar. Um, well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Absolutely, and I, and I, I mean it. And I hopefully we can meet face to face uh, soon. And I would love well, to I meant that. to do this actually at the Golf Magazine Top 100 Summit because I saw you there. Yeah. And it was one of those things that uh, the introvert in me got the better of me. So, oh man. Um, I, uh, I definitely, cause I, uh, I tend to gravitate to the people that I know and yeah, not, yeah, sure, I, we especially all in those situations. Yeah. So the next time we're in those situations, I am definitely coming to introduce myself in person. Awesome. So. Awesome. Well, tell, uh, tell the listeners how they can follow you on social. I know you just, you just got an Instagram page, which is exciting. Yes. Uh, <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so Instagram and then uh, Twitter and then um, 
you know, just, uh, you know, my website. Um, so what are your handles? Give them your handles. Is it just your you name? You know, just my name. Yeah, <laughs> just my name. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's how naive I am to all of this because, um, yeah, I, I, I can't deliver this as well. So I apologize for that. But, yeah, if you search Jeff Leishman Golf, um, you definitely will find all those things. Awesome, man. Thanks so much for your time. I really, really enjoyed it. And I appreciate your your knowledge and your stories. And uh, it's all just fantastic. So keep well, up the great thank work. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I do look forward to uh, hanging out in person. Absolutely. We'll do it. Okay. Take care. What's up, everybody? Guru back here again with a couple of things before you jump off. Uh, first, big thank you to Jeff for coming on the show and sharing his incredible knowledge about teaching, uh, coaching, and life that I know will help you become all better coaches. Uh, make sure you follow Jeff on the gram and Twitter at Jeff Leishman and give him a social wave and say thank you. Also, check out his website at jeffleishman.com uh, and you can see who all he's working with and who he is consulting with as well, which is super cool. Thanks again to our sponsor, envyedhemp.com. Make sure you use the promo code GURU20 for that 20% discount for life. You can also follow me on Twitter and the gram at GolfGuruTV. Thank you so much for pushing my Twitter uh, followers over 10,000. So I appreciate that. And then let's get the Instagram up. I'm putting a lot of stuff on Instagram. Uh, Make sure you download my app and download the Golf Guru app. It's less than $20 a month. So I'm basically giving it away now. So go to the, to the app store and download that and subscribe as I'm putting out some really cool content, uh, some live lessons, and we'll be shooting some more content and video uh, here very, very soon. So you don't want to miss out on that. If you have a question or a comment, you can email the show at golfgurushow at gmail.com or hit me up on the DM. Music is by Kevin McLeod and Zach Mullet. And leave me an iTunes review. Thank you so much for all the reviews so far. Leave me a five-star rating. Let me know how I'm doing. Super cool. And then as I leave you with Mr. Jim Rohn, study, practice, teach, and then pass it on. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you next time.